Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Lift up your name this morning, Lord. Name above all names. Nothing stands higher in our lives than you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship him this morning. Father, we just thank you for this morning in this church. Thank you that we are yours, covered by your blood. We thank you for all, all of our life, before you and even now, because you had your hand on us and eye on us. You took us out, we were lost, and you made us whole again. Yes, we are whole only because of you, Lord, only because of your work on the cross. And though the world spins in a tizzy, we can have peace. Church, we can have peace through this all, through his name. Though the mountains may crumble on each side of us, we stand on the rock. Hallelujah. The rock of our salvation. And we no need to fear. There's no need to tremble. There's no need to run. There's no need to cower. Oh, Lord, comforts us. Thank you, Jesus. Well, things are not perfect. and things go wrong, we have his love. We have his full attention. Do you realize that, church? We have the Lord's full attention. There is not a moment... He's away from us. There's no signs that go up saying, I'm coming back in 10 minutes. I'm taking a lunch break. He never takes a break from us. Hallelujah. Think about that for a moment. The Lord never takes a break from us. Praise you, God. Praise you. Praise you, Father, for that. You see our needs. You see our hearts. You see our lives. We cry out to you, Father. And we cling to you, our all in all. We love you, Father. Bless this place today. May your spirit rest on us as we abide in you. Each day is a new day in you. You restore us, you strengthen us, and guide us as we surrender to you fully. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I just want to read a few verses. I got to your things. You know what that means? That means there's a new song. <laughs> Psalm 18, 47 through 49. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 9, 3. Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. Deuteronomy 24. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Praise him for that. Amen. Psalms 109, 30. I will greatly praise the Lord of my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude. And Psalm 150, 1 through 6, is what we stand by up here. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. We're going to praise him with trumpet sound, with lute and harp, with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals, with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Now, I have written down, we, we, are to, we are to live our lives in such confidence in God that we are not shaken from our trust in Him by any circumstance. We are told to rejoice always and to give thanks in all things. We do so by focusing our heart, mind, and will on God, who is bigger than our circumstances. To praise God at any time is a good thing, but to praise him in difficult circumstance is an intentional choice to trust God no matter what. Because God is waiting for us to sing 
in the middle of our storms. Okay? And, he, and remember who he is despite our circumstance. When we make our weapon a melody, heaven comes to fight for us. God fights for us. Praising him, regardless of the circumstances, vital and powerful. This song carries the same message. It reminds us of the biblical principle that God inhabits the praises of his people. And God will fight on our behalf as we sing out our praise. So when we are in the presence of our enemies, when things seem like a mystery, when unbelief is creeping in, when we're in the middle of a storm or surrounded by darkness, we should raise a hallelujah. Any time and every time is a good time to raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is melody and I'll raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar I'll raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I'll raise a hallelujah. I'll watch the darkness flee. I'll raise a hallelujah in the midst. I'll raise a hallelujah Feel you lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar In the middle of the storm, love. 
Praise Him this morning. Hallelujah. Just remain in worship right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is love in the name of Jesus. There is life in the name of Jesus. There is power in his name. There's everlasting love in his name. There's eternal life in his name. Oh, what a day. Sing how wonderful.
lifting hands. Lifting hands in song and dance, humbled by the glory of the cross. been redeemed and reconciled, caught up in the splendor of it all. Eternal life He gave, so we will bring a song of praise. How I Of mercy, God of mercy, God of love, how we marvel at your majesty. As we kneel before your throne in the beauty of your mystery, oh, sing it out, church. We're children of the King. Father of your love, we sing. How wonderful, how lovely is your name. You can't. Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus.
power in the name There is love in the name oh, There is life in the name In the holy name of Jesus Sing, there is power There is power in the name There is love in his name. There is life in the name. In the name of Jesus. Worship him. Thank you for all of your power. Thank you for your love, Lord. And the life you give us. And we worship you for that. We love you because you first loved us. And oh, what a love. Oh, what a love you have for us. Oh, what a love. There is no love greater than his love. Thank you, Jesus. Imagine church the praise and worship when we're face to face with him. Oh. Hallelujah. this morning for loving us. Thank him this morning for capturing our hearts. We thank you, Father, for all that. We bring you all the glory. We bring you all the praise all in your name. May we live for you and shine for you and do your work as we are here until that one glorious day. Hallelujah, until that one day. We meet you face to face, hallelujah. That one day is mind blowing, but we are looking forward beyond. To embracing you for eternity. for all your church and your nation in these times Lord we know you're in control Father and let us stand strong let us stand on your word and on our principles Father no matter what we go through because you have our back you got our front, you got our sides you got our top and bottom we're fully engulfed in your protection and your spirit 
And in your name we pray over this nation. In your name we pray over the children of this nation, Father. Open their eyes and cover them with your blood, Father. We thank you that we can breathe air. Praise your name with our voices, our hearts, and our hands this morning, Lord. May your spirit continue in this place as the word of God is fed to us. We thank you, we love you, and we adore you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. It's good to see. I got to tell you, when I was up here praying and just hearing everybody fellowshipping, and it's good to be in fellowship one with another. Amen? Amen. Yeah, it's, it's good to come and worship the Lord this morning. All right, Mikey, what are you trying to give me, a heart attack twice in, in a few months? See that guy sitting there? My best friend growing up. I think we're going on like 50-something years. Oh, don't let him talk to you because he will tell you stories. <clears throat> but as we pray this morning, I want to lift up a couple of people in the church for prayer. And, but then, uh, being that, as Mike reminded me, 1025 and how it worked out, that all the churches were supposed to open their doors this morning and pray for our nation. So I have something I'm going to read up here uh, in, at that time, but I first would like to take a few people to prayer this morning, and I'm going to read this to you and then share some stuff with you. Amen? Okay. Richie, right? All right. You got it. Just on some good, good note, too, Judy uh, Duck is coming home tomorrow. Ms. Quinn and I are going to pick her up, bring her home. She sounds great. I want to thank all the ladies who stepped up to make meals for her. That's how the body of Christ works. When someone is in need, we step up and do what we've got to do. Amen? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord, the time of worship, the presence of your spirit, Lord God, and we just uh, glorify your name and magnify you. That, Lord, you are our shield and protector, our provider and healer, our all in all, our shepherd who cares for his sheep. And we just praise and thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this time of fellowship and worship. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord with brothers and sisters who are like-minded. Glory to your name, Lord. And, Father, we do lift up Sister Judy. We thank you that you saw her through the surgery. We thank you, Lord, that she's doing well. She's uh, in rehab, my God. We thank you she's coming home tomorrow. And I thank you, Lord, for all those who have stepped up to minister to her and demonstrate the love of Christ in her life, Lord. So just continue to be with her, help her to heal quickly, and we look forward to the day when she's back with us in church. And Father, we do lift up Mr. Dimitri, the uh, a father of a, a couple of young men who have come to our youth group. Lord, as he's in the hospital, I don't know exactly what's going on, but you do, so we just pray that you would touch him and be with his family, Lord God. Just watch over them and, Lord, see him through whatever infirmity he has and just bring him back 100%, my God. And, Lord, we do lift up Sister Helen as she's praying for wisdom for her family. Lord God, you know the situation in the Bloomquest house. We just ask that you would move mightily upon the boys, that you would convict their hearts, Lord, before they take a wrong path, Lord God. And be with Dave. We pray that you would bring him back into fellowship with you, Lord God, as he once professed your name and walked in the halls of this church, Lord God, we ask that he would come back and, Lord, you would just be with Helen as she deals with so much in so many ways. Just watch over her, we ask, and the family. And, Father, for Richie, we just pray that as he goes for this bone marrow scan, Lord, that, uh, my God, all the tests would be negative, that you would touch him and heal him. And, Lord, more than anything, that you would draw his heart to you. Draw his heart to you, Lord, that he would find the ultimate healing, not just the healing in flesh, but the healing of his spirit unto eternal life. Help him to open his heart to what Liz has to say to him, his mom has to say to him, and just watch over the situation. And Lord, for the quiet desires of our heart, that you would move this morning. And most of all, Lord, we ask for unsaved loved ones, 
that they would put their faith in you, especially, Lord, when no man knows the day or the hour that you'll call them home, and no one knows the day or the hour where that trumpet will blow. And, Lord, we pray that none of our loved ones would have to go through the tribulation or enter into a lost eternity. So hear our prayers, my God, for family, for wives or husbands who aren't saved, for children, grandchildren, siblings, Lord. Hear our prayers, O oh God. And Lord, again, we just thank you. We thank you that you sit on the throne of heaven and you hear the prayers of your people. And we just thank you, my God, in your name. Amen and amen. amen. So I'd like to read something to you guys, and then uh, I have them here. Uh, there's only 50, so um, what I would ask would be one per family. But this is a wonderful booklet on the Christian's responsibility for civic engagement. And what it does, it goes through 10 key issues on what the two parties believe. And what you will see is that one party, though neither one of these is perfect, one party supports pro-life. One party supports the sanctity of marriage. One party supports one nation under God. And I may say this, and you may get upset, some people, but I'm going to say it. As Christians, we need to be wise in our votes, what's going to bring him glory and honor. Amen. If there is something that a particular party does that the Lord God hates, I would have a hard time looking in the mirror at myself if I can vote for somebody that I know is going to do something that my Savior hates, the one who died for me. So be wise in that booth, because let me tell you, we may not be able to do this if a particular party gets in. The socialist agenda, the communist agenda, whatever you want to call it, will go against Jews and Christians. Study history. Study history. Know your history. Don't go on emotion. Study your history and see what's happened. Millions, and I mean hundreds of millions, have died at the hands of socialists, communists, and fascists. So on that said, forgive me. No, I won't say forgive me. But I would like to read this. And being that President Trump is our president right now, and these cards are available, the books will be on the back. I wouldn't put them out, but please, one per family, not one for Uncle Carl and, Uncle, and Aunt Louie or whatever. Just one per family, please. Oh, Aunt Millie. Everybody, every Italian's got an Aunt Millie. Little whiskers coming out. And, all right. <laughs> all right, so it says, Lord God, we bring President Trump before your throne in the name of Jesus. We pray that you will answer him when he calls to you in a day of trouble. May your name as the God of Jacob protect him. Please send him help from your sanctuary and give him support from your unseen temple in the heavens. We pray that you will save him and answer him from your holy heaven with the saving might of your right hand. We pray that he will not trust in chariots or horses, but instead learn to trust in your name as the Lord our God. Amen. Cause him to stand firm as he trusts in you. Grant him every desire and petition of his heart that is pleasing to you and cause every plan of his that is in accordance with your will to succeed. We ask you to grant our request on this behalf that we may shout for joy and lift up banners in your name when your will is done through him. We acknowledge that as you set the crown on King David's head, so you have elevated President Trump to the highest office in our land. We pray that he will rejoice in your strength and not his own. We pray that you will draw him near to you so that you make him glad with the joy of your presence. As he trusts in you, we pray that because of your steadfast love, the love of the Most High, he will not be moved or shaken. Grant him life and length of days and eternal blessings. We know that this president has enemies who are, unseen, are seen and unseen, enemies who hate him and will devise mischief against him. We pray in Jesus' name that every evil plan devised against him and against your purposes through him will be thwarted. May his enemies, seen and unseen, be put to flight, and may their plans not succeed. Together we pray that you will save him, so that together with him we may exalt you in your strength and sing and praise your might as the Most High God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. And I want to tell you something. Sal and I and John do not talk, well, I talk to them, obviously, but we don't talk about my sermon or anything. When you hear the sermon today, it parallels the word that came, and it parallels the worship and what you were reading up here. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 Miss Ellen. Amen. 
Yes, and I heard that the gentleman from Duck Dynasty actually led him to the Lord. So he's a man, he's a work in progress like the rest of us, trust me. I like to see all of us when our suits and game faces from church are off. Mm hmm? Mm hmm? Amen? So let's just go to prayer for our nation, prayer for our president, a prayer for Amy Coney Barrett as uh, the Senate is meeting today and they're going to vote on her tomorrow. I mean, that's a, a voice that protects life and protects marriage. Amen? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come for our nation, and what we do ask, Lord, is mercy. Mercy. For what this nation has done over the last 50 years, Lord, we deserve judgment. Lord God, we have shed 70-something million innocent lives in this nation. We have turned our back on you. We have taken your laws and principles and commands out of our justice, out of our schools, and we've indoctrinated our children through the education system with fallacy, falsehoods, Lord. I worked in it for 30 years, indoctrinating them with socialist and liberal ideas that are contrary to your word. Lord God, we come and ask for mercy, that you would raise up righteous men and women to fill positions in authority that would fear you, that would love you, and cry out for righteous decrees and laws. Lord God, we ask that you would move upon our nation upon this coming election. Remove those who would stand against you and raise up those who would stand for you, Lord. Lord God, we pray because we desire the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage back in our nation. We desire that your name be exalted once again. This nation was founded on Christian principles. Do your homework, study and see. The fallacy that 1619, that they just came here to endorse slavery, hogwash, hogwash. Lord, we ask that you would have mercy. Mercy, my God, that you would raise up those who would serve you. And Lord, again, we just lift up Amy Coney Barrett, that if this is the woman that you would have in this position that would stand, that does stand for you, Lord, that obeys the principles of your word, that you would put her in this position to protect, use those in authority to protect the values that we hold so dear. Even the very gathering of the church together, as we see in these states that are coming against you, they're trying to inhibit the voice of the church because as John gave your word, if you silence prayer, the forces of darkness rejoice because they know that it's our voice that can rise to the heavens and move the hand of God. So Lord, we ask again for grace and mercy in our nation with this coming election. And it's in your name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Yes, ma'am. One more thing. Hey, one more thing. Colombo. Israel has aligned itself with several Arabs. Yes. Which has never happened. Yes. And they have come into Israel. It's never happened. So they don't like Trump. No. Part of the no, and listen. I do stand in my own prayer time. This man looks, what, and we know it's part of God's prophetic plan, but he stands in unison with Israel. And let's stand on the word that those who bless Israel will be blessed. Amen. 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 So pray God's word back to him. Amen. 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 All right. So now for all who want to stone me, the door's over there. Okay. <laughs> all right. Ma'am. Oh, okay. No. So if anybody else would like to help make meals for Judy and also... Since more people are coming in, please follow protocols. Let's not roam around the sanctuary without a mask. I hate the masks. My nose starts running, but this is what we have to do. There are some elderly in here. We want to protect those. And the last thing we want to do is have that thing hit our church, then we've got to shut down for two weeks. So we don't want that or whatever, how many days. So please follow the protocols. There's hand sanitizer all over the place. They do, do, do. Just do what you've got to do, as they say. That's my Italian coming out. So this morning, let's go to prayer and open up with the word of God. What? Oh, the kids. Kids are really sorry, Tim. I'll get it sooner or later. Sooner or later, I'm going to get this right. Kids are released to Children's Church. Humanus rugratiuses. Please go to the back. <laughs> Genus and species. All right. Lord God, again, we just thank you. Please bless this word to our hearts today as we open up with this wonderful epistle. And Lord, I just thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your leading and guiding. In your name, amen. Again, listen to the sermon, the words that came prophetically, and the, the worship this morning. But this morning, we are going to start a study in the Apostles Paul's 
letter to the people we know in Philippi, and it's better known as what? Philippians, the book of Philippians, okay? But before we get started with any book, with any theological study, if you will, we gotta know the W questions, the who, what, when, where, why. Why was the book written? What's the purpose of the book? What's, what's Paul trying to say to us through the uh, moving of the Holy Spirit? So with that said, let's just quickly look at some of the W questions this morning. And it is agreed upon that the person who wrote the epistle to the Philippians is Paul, along with Ephesians, Colossians, and um, Philemon. He wrote these while in prison at Rome. So he was in prison when he wrote these four epistles. They're called the prison epistles. And Philippians is probably written around 61 AD, okay? Philippi, now listen, was a very important city as it was a gateway from the east from areas like Greece and Rome because it sat on the Adriatic and Aegean seas. So it became a center of trade and cultural diffusion. So a lot of people were passing through the city, if you will. Paul visited this city on his second missionary journey. Um, remember at the time, if you're reading Acts, if you came out on Wednesday night when Mike did a wonderful study on the book of Acts, they wanted to go into Asia, and the Holy Spirit was like, put the brakes on, Paulie, you ain't going to Asia. There's a guy calling for you in Macedonia, I want you to go to Macedonia. So Paul, being obedient to the Holy Spirit, made his way to Macedonia. But prior to going there, he passed through two cities, Derbe and Lystra, which are in the area of Galatia. And he came in contact with a young disciple named Timothy. And what he does, he conscripts Timothy into coming with him as a young disciple to work with Paul on his missionary journeys. Now, he used Paul, uh, Timothy, really as a replacement because of many of us who have studied scripture, we know that John Mark left Barnabas and Paul and went back to his mama. And then Paul and Barnabas split and he had two missionary teams, but Paul picks up Timothy kind of to replace Mark, if you will. Now, what's important is when we read about Timothy, his mother was a Jewess, she was Jewish, and his father was a Greek. Now, that's very important because as Paul takes them along, guess who they're going to minister to? Jews and Gentiles. So he has an understanding of both cultures, just like his mentor, Paul, who what? Grew up in Tarsus, a Gentile city, but was also in a rabbinical study under Gamaliel, one of the leading rabbis in Israel, to become basically a rabbi and part of the Sanhedrin. So both these men fit the bill because they understood Judaism and they understood the Gentile world to be the ones to take the gospel to both Jew and Gentile, all right? Now, and to go on, while on their way to Macedonia, what did they do? They passed through the city of Philippi. And what does Paul do into every city he goes into? He goes to the synagogue to preach the gospel, and that is exactly what he did. And at that point, the church in Philippi is birthed, and about 10 years later, Paul is going to actually write this epistle to the Philippians, all right? All right, so we've got to ask ourselves, why? Why? What prompted him? Why did the Holy Spirit prompt him to send this letter 10 years after birthing the church? Well, I'm glad you asked, as my pastor used to say, all right? Uh, first of all, he wanted to thank the Philippian church. They were wonderful in their giving. They helped to establish the church in Philippi, and they also gave money to help them with the churches in Corinth and the church in Jerusalem. And may I say to the church at Neighborhood, when there is a need, you guys, for 30 years that I've been here, have been wonderful in stepping up financially, with physical labor, in making meals, whatever it is, visiting, to meet the needs of the people in the church. And not only in this church, but the way we support missions, God has blessed us, amen? amen. Praise God. The second reason, he wanted to thank them for sending a, a dear brother named Epaphroditus to them. Epaphroditus came with gifts to help Paul out while he was in Rome. And what had happened while he was there, he became gravely ill. So Paul writes to the Philippian church to let him know that Epaphroditus was delayed because he got sick. And he wanted to know that he's coming back to you soon, that God spared him from death and has made him well. But also, what he was writing that about, listen carefully. He was trying to let the Philippian people know that he didn't abandon the faith. Epaphroditus didn't abandon the faith like Mark did. And all of a sudden, the wagging tongues would start, okay, when Epaphroditus returned. So he wanted to silence the wagging tongues. And I put in bold letters in my notes, 
Oh, the wagging tongues that speak without knowledge, how destructive they can be. Amen? Amen? All right. And then the third reason is that two sisters, Syntyche and Yodia, were arguing. So he's writing them to say, there shouldn't be disunity in the churches because it only gives the devil a foothold to destroy a work. So try as best as we can to be those humble servants and keep unity within the body of Christ because there's nothing better the devil would like to do is a foothold of division and destroy a work. And we've seen it after church, after church, after church. Amen? So that's the third reason. Finally, Paul addresses is that false teachers are starting to enter into the church and teach apostasy. Oh, if Paul was alive today, when the Pope comes out and says that civil unions are okay. And listen, we should never treat or mistreat anybody wrong, okay? People are people and they need to be witnessed to. But sadly, you got to look at the eternal picture. This book says that those who practice that lifestyle will go into an eternal hell. So we're not being homophobes. We're trying to spare people by giving the truth in love that they won't spend eternity in hell. How does a man who has millions of followers come out and say, I don't care that with what I say could send thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, into a lost eternity? Apostasy. And apostasy has slipped its way into the Christian churches as well. And we have to be careful. So with that said, let me give you a foretaste of two of the major themes we will encounter in this letter. One, that's going to be a major blessing to us. And the second is a blessing to others. How can you go wrong? A blessing to the church and a blessing to others. What, a, what an epistle. All right? And listen carefully. The first one, the theme I, I believe that's going to be a blessing, is that in this epistle, Paul's going to outline to go and preach the gospel. Bring the gospel of, the sal of salvation to others, regardless, listen carefully, of the challenges facing us personally or the challenges that are facing us as the body of Christ. Preach the word because lives are at stake, souls are at stake, and there is no cost too high, no persecution that we can face that can compare to the saving of one soul. Amen? Souls. None of us here can ever compare any persecution we incur or even martyrdom to that of the sinless one who paid the ultimate price to make the way for lost sinners. Amen. Remember, he's the son of God who came and took the entire wrath of God, something he did not deserve, so that we, the ones who did deserve it, could be set free and be saved. Amen? Nothing we go through can compare to what the Savior went through. He was the Son of God. Amen? And Christian, he desires that none should be lost, but that all should come to salvation. All should come to salvation. And we can never say to him, the price is too high, the sacrifice too great, because as we say that to him, you know what he'll do? This. Look. You think the price is too high? I paid the ultimate. Amen? How can you compare it to that? The Son of God. And the second major theme that's a blessing to us, the church, is the message of the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength, is it not? As Christians who are filled with the Spirit, we are seated with the fruit of the Spirit, and one of them is joy. And, this, and listen, this doesn't talk to happiness. Happiness is based on, circum, uh, on circumstances. But joy is based on a relationship with Jesus Christ because it's only then when we put our faith in Christ that he fills us with the fruit of the Spirit and one of them is joy. Amen? Praise God. And we're going to get into this in more detail when we get into the heart of the epistle. And church, when we study this epistle, it gives the prescription for how to experience the joy of the Lord. And it's described in this, and it's over 12 times in the noun form or the verb form is the term joy written in the epistle to the, to the Philippians. It's the joy epistle, if you will. Amen. Praise God, amen? amen? And as I mentioned, please listen, this epistle of joy is being written by a man 
who, had experienced, who was in prison, experienced all kinds of hardship, hardships, and wasn't even sure if at that point he was going to be martyred by the Romans. This is the guy writing the joy epistle. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. This is Paul's life, and he's saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. Boy, can I relate to him. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once pelted with stones, and when he was stoned, he was left for dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and day in the open sea. I had been constantly on the move. I had been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. So he ticked everybody off. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger in the sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the pressure of the churches. And then in 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7, it says this, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. In other words, he's about to be martyred. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is Paul who's saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Do you see what this man went through? But he rejoices in the Lord, and there's a reason for that. And that's part of what the study is going to be about. How can this man rejoice in the Lord? Amen? In the midst of all that he faced, he could only endure it by the grace of God, Amen. by the understanding of whom he belonged to. And listen, he didn't succumb to self-pity, fear, discouragement, or dismay. Instead, he writes about the joy of the Lord to the Philippians. But guys, it's not only for the Philippians. It's for us too. That's, that's why when Sal was saying and, and, and reading up here, in the midst of everything, we can have the joy of the Lord because it's not based on circumstances. It's based on our relationship with Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. And this is where we have to start, right here, to get an understanding of the epistle. In order to experience such joy, biblical joy, a rejoicing not based on circumstances, but on what God is going ready to accomplish in and through the circumstances. That's where we have to focus. It must begin with a salvation relationship with Jesus Christ. It has to start there because that's when we receive the fruit of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells. Those seeds are planted in our hearts, in the regenerated soil of our hearts, that are just waiting to be cultivated so we can mature in Christ. But those seeds are planted. Listen to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And that word love is agape or agape, however you'd like to say it. It's a sacrificial love shown to us by Christ. Joy, peace, forbearance, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. Why? Because those fruits at the heart are the embodiment of Jesus Christ. That's why there's no law. If you can live in those fruits, you're living Christ-like life. Amen? Amen? And a question we can ask is this. How can a person trust the one true and living God in the midst of one's circumstances if he or she does not have an intimate relationship with the Lord? The answer is they can't. Hence, all the fear, discouragement that you see in people who don't know Jesus Christ. And sadly, it's that oppressive spirit is falling over the people in the church. Rejoice in the Lord. These are circumstantial things that will take place before he comes back. Instead, rejoice knowing that he's coming soon. Amen? Amen. Look at Paul. Look at all that he went through. Never got discouraged or self-pity or fearful or dismayed because he saw things in the light of eternity. Praise God. And church, listen carefully. More often than not, these fruits, unfortunately, are going to be developed in the tests and trials of life. And just like any other fruit tree that is pruned in order to bear good fruit, so we have to be pruned in order to bear good fruit. And some of us are pruned more than others, unfortunately. Oh, right? Listen to John, John 15, 1 and 2. 
one and two, and one and two. Hmm. I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so to be more fruitful. Ooh, you want to develop good fruit? Patience? Well, don't pray for patience. My pastor used to say, they understand. You want to learn how to really sacrificially love? You want to have joy and peace? To learn how to have self-control? Well, guess what? We will face tests and trials to see if, in fact, those fruits are being developed. And when they're not, snip, 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 snip. And then the next test of trial comes and we do a little bit better. Amen? Praise God. But here's the key. Here's the key. We're not talking about happiness. Happiness will go along with the ups and downs of life. We're speaking about being joyful within the circumstances, believing by faith that the Lord works all things together for good. They may not be good. You'll hear me say it all too often, but he's working them together for good. Do we believe that, church, by faith? Do we? Mm. But in the midst, and what he's trying to develop are those fruits of the Spirit. Therefore, we can stand on the assurance that no matter what we face, it is God working in it and through it to help us mature and become more like Christ. And that should be the greatest joy in our life. The greatest joy. And why? Because if we read Romans 8, 28 and 29, it says, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to the Lord, at the end it says, so they will be molded into the image of my son. God's ultimate purpose for all of us is to mold us into Jesus Christ. So when we go through those things that develop those fruits and those fruits evidence themselves in our life, rejoice because we're becoming more like the Savior, the Father's ultimate plan for us. Praise the Lord. And listen to James 1, 2, and 4, our favorite verse in the scripture, and then many of you know it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Ready? Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. So why the test and trials? To make us mature and complete, not lacking anything, so we're Christ-like. And it's, it's funny, Sal. I'm laughing. At, I'm saying, what well, the guy steal my notes? All right? It will be a conscious choice. Do you hear me? Through the power of the Holy Spirit to purpose to be joyful in the tests and trials of life. We're not being like, oh, this is great. I'm being beaten with a stick. No, but we can choose to rejoice in the midst of our tests and trials because we know that God has a greater purpose for it. Do you hear me? Do you believe in the God that you say, that you and I say we believe in, that he is sovereign, not only over the affairs of heaven and earth, but also over the affairs of our individual and personal lives? Is he providentially sovereign over everything? Then we can trust him. And remember what I said. I've said it before. If we're walking with him and things happen, we know God is working it for a purpose. If we go this way or this way, yes, he will discipline us. That's our own stupidity and get to get us back on, on the right track. You hear me? But if we're walking with the Lord and things are happening, there's a reason. There's a reason, Lord. I don't know why I have this hernia and every time I stand up, I'm in pain, but you're in control. True. All right? So we just trust him. I don't know where I am in this, but that's okay. All right. Look at this. In Jesus' instructions to his disciples, I actually got off track a little bit here. Hold on a sec, guys. Okay. And church, may I say this morning that now more than ever, with all that we see going on in the world, we need to cultivate this fruit of joy. So as, listen, not to succumb to fear, discouragement, depression, anger, hatred, and all those emotions that go along with it. Because if we give in and we're watching the debates, and we're listening, and we're hearing, and we're watching all the anarchy that's going on, all of a sudden fear can set in. I've seen it set in me, like, oh my God, if this guy gets elected, I'm gonna end up in jail. Either that or, you know, whatever, I don't know what's gonna happen. Or discouragement, or that oppressive spirit, or hatred, because we start getting mad. We wanna go through the TV, yes? 
We can't let those things well up inside of us. As Christians, we need to be joyful and rejoice because of who we know is absolutely in sovereign control over the whole shebang. If Mr. So-and-so should get in and the country should go this way, there is a reason. Doesn't God lift up one and bring down another? There is a reason. Will we be happy? No. Can we rejoice? Yes. Because all we should be thinking is, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. And maybe it'll be a wake-up uh, call for the faithful. And I believe it has been. I've seen more people praying and more prayer going on than I have in the last 10 years. So we're praying. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. So with all that said, let's get into verses 1 and 2 of Philippians. Hallelujah. I only got to page 6. And I, got, I finally got to verses 1 and 2. So let's, let's do it. It says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So right off the bat, we see that the two who are addressing Philippi are who? Paul and Timothy. And even in this simple opening, it's something for us to learn. And it's this, that those who are mature, listen carefully, please, who are mature in Christ, those who have been involved in ministry to whatever capacity, have a responsibility to develop the younger Christian in their maturation in the faith. Amen. Timothy went along with Paul, and Paul nurtured him in the faith. Do you hear me? In Jesus' instructions to the disciples, he didn't just say, go out and convert. He said, go out and make disciples, which means invest in them. Amen? And I'm laughing because this lady here has invested her life in Melissa, and she's growing in leaps and bounds in her faith in the Lord. Amen? Listen to Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It says this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Okay baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, which means teach them the word of God. Amen? You see, church, we need to become personally involved in discipling those we lead to Christ, those we build relationships with. Why? Just as a newborn babe needs to be nurtured, so does a newborn babe in Christ. Amen? And it'll take investment. It will take time, it will take energy on our part, but it's worth it in the long run. It's called eternity. And there's a reason I'm saying that. We can meet with them, we can attend services with them, take them to a men's group, take them to a women's group, do these things, meet with them and teach them the word of God. Bring them to church where they'll hear the word because we don't want them to be picked off and be like the seed that fell on rocky soil in the parable of the sower where it had no root and it faded away because it wasn't nurtured. I want to thank Danny and Deanna Napolitano. He works as a teacher. She's a teacher. She's got two little kids, but they have sacrificed their time to minister to our youth on Wednesday night. They're investing in the next generation. Do you hear me? The girl is tired. I met with her the other day. She looked cross-eyed, but she's willing to come out and minister to our youth. Danny's working. He's teaching. Amen? Sal and Michelle, they got a a lot going on in their house, but the time they spent to minister to you guys. It's investing Amen. in other people. Mike is 79. Sorry, Mike. He's up there in age, but he's still ministering the word of God. He's trying to disciple us in the word so that we grow and mature. Amen. We invest. We invest our time, our talents, our efforts. Amen. And listen carefully, the only source of discipling is the Word of God. Oh, it's not what I feel, or what I think, or what the latest Christian book says, or the latest philosophy, philosophy book says. <clears throat> Jesus said, teach them everything I've commanded you. We teach them the Word of God, and we don't turn to the left or to the right. We stay on course with the Word. Amen? We tell you a lot of stories, but it ain't going to help you grow in, the, in Christ. Amen? Listen to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, showing people where they're wrong, correcting, teaching them what is right. 
Amen? And training in righteousness, that's sanctified living, so that the servant of God, hang on to that, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work through the word of God. We teach, we correct, we rebuke, we train, so that trains up the disciples of Christ to be servants of the Most High. Amen? Amen? Church, this is what Paul did with Timothy to the point he addresses Timothy as his son in the faith. That's the relationship they built. Amen? I see it in these two. It's more like a, a mother and daughter than it is like an aunt and, 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 and a, a niece, excuse me, a niece-in-law, right? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. And listen to this, what it says in 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, it says this. You then, my son, be strong in the grace in, that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Pass it along, Melissa, once you learn, to your girls, to your children, and disciple them. Amen? And what I likened it to, when you take that rock and you throw it in the pond, it starts as one little bloop, but then, and that's the church. That's our commission. I disciple you, you disciple them, we disciple others, and the word of God goes forth and the church grows. But you have to disciple them in the word of God. Don't leave them hanging, because then they'll get all these guys, like I said last week, come to your door, and they'll tell you, well, Jesus wasn't the son of God, he was the archangel Michael. <clears throat> you have to protect that young Padawan from the false teaching that's out there. And that word Padawan is from Star Wars, so I just love that word. <laughs> all right. And, at, and in time, we know from church history, what does Timothy become? He becomes an overseer in the church in Ephesus. So Paul did his job. This young man grew up, and he became an overseer in the church. All right. So let's go on out to what I call real Christianity. Ooh, real Christianity. Yes, real Christianity. And it's seen in the next very simple word in verse 1 that describes Paul and Timothy. You ready? Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. And you know what? I was, wasn't going to share this, but too bad. We've got time. I was jogging around the pond early in the morning, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just came on me. And he said, the church needs to understand that we are servants of God. If the church can get a grip of that, if the people of God can get a grip that we are servants of Jesus Christ, the church will be on fire. Do you hear me? then we won't be pulled away by sports and media and this and that and the pleasures of this world because we are servants of the Master. Amen? And the Holy Spirit was saying, let your church get hold of this. We have to see ourselves in this time where all these things are distracting to us, that there's only one person who we need to give our hearts and lives to, and it's Jesus Christ. Amen? The word is doulos in the Greek, ibed in the Hebrew. And it means bond servant, bond slave. Do you hear me? Oh, I'm screaming. Sorry, Lord. The pastor would have yelled at me. And listen carefully. It carries these terms with it. The basic idea of subservience and insignificance. Do you hear me? In respect to the master. Subservient in that our lives are ded totally dedicated to him. You hear me? Totally dedicated to him. Nothing should take our place before the master. Amen. Amen? And it's insignificant, and he always receives the glory, the honor, and the praise, no matter what work we do. If you're the pastor of the church, the worship leader, the guy who takes care of the building, we don't get the glory. He gets the glory. Amen? Amen? Praise God. And this term doulos was sometimes used there's someone who voluntarily became subservient to another, but it most like, more than often referred to those who were in permanent bondage to the master. Now, there's a great sermon for today, huh? Oh, permanent bondage to a master? Yeah, that's what it says in the Word of God. There was no release from this position until the person died. They were, for their life, entrusted to their master. Amen? And as I stated, there is a word in the Hebrew, it's ibed, and there's a little catchphrase in the Hebrew that allows for a little escape clause. So listen carefully, all right? If, uh, 
a Hebrew slave worked for someone for seven years, after seven years, they could be let go unless they choose to stay with the master. Listen to Exodus 21, 2 to 6. It says this. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he's free to go alone. But if he comes with a wife, if he has a wife when he comes, she's to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons and daughters, the women and the children belong to the master, but only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master, I love my wife and children, and don't want to go free, then the master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to a door, doorpost and drive an awl through his ear, and then he becomes a doulos, a bond servant for life. So if the person chooses this, as we see in the end of verse 6, if he chooses to stay, he can stay with the master. Now take a step back for a moment. I want you to think about this scenario. The servant is relinquishing his own personal freedom. He is relinquishing all his rights. In essence, he is saying, I give up everything to you, the master, to serve you, and I will do everything according to your will and your desire, no matter the circumstances, no matter the conditions. How many people would be willing to give up all their freedom? Think about it. And this becomes the servant's mantra. Whatever you say I will do, wherever you send me, I will go, because your will has become my will. Amen? So let me ask you a question. Why would any person make such a decision when we in our flesh are self-willed, self-centered, and have a sense of self-determination? That's the human heart. So why would we be willing to give that up? And I believe it's because of the master. The master loved them, treated them kindly, provided for them with food and shelter and housing, treated the wife and children well. It was because of the master. The master had to be very special. And being under the authority, the, the servant knew that all his needs, all that he embellished would be cared for by the master, if you will. All right? And so... We have to understand this statement that Paul and Timothy are saying they are bond servants, that they're douloses, that they're ebeds, that they're giving their entire wills and life to that of the master. And they're relinquishing everything to the master's will. And who, uh, and you got to understand, who are they bond servants to? They're bond servants to Jesus Christ. That's what it tells us. Bond servants to Christ. And why? Listen, it's none other than the perfect master who purchased his bondservants with his own shed blood on the cross. That's why they realized how much that, he, that the master loved them because he went to the cross and took their judgment wrath for sin. Can we grasp that, church? That we should love him and make him our master and we his servants because we see what he did for us on the cross of Calvary, what we've been delivered from and what we've been delivered to. If he can do that for us, do you think that under his will, he's going to bring us into harm and disaster? Absolutely not. He loves us with an eternal love. And so we can humbly submit ourselves to him knowing that he's got our perfect life in control under his perfect will. And then we can rejoice. No matter what happens, we can rejoice because he's got us. Amen? Praise God. Christian, this is what we are called to. And if you want an example, yes, we can look at Paul. We can go through that passage we read. We can look at the martyrs. But you really want to look at somebody? Look at this one who died for our sins. That's the one. Because as we go on to Philippians, we'll see that he was willing to humble himself, become nothing, made himself nothing, and was willing to go to the cross of Calvary. And if he can humble himself before his Father in heaven as a servant to his Father, how much more is his disciples can we humble ourselves in service to him? And now please listen to what Jesus says about those who are his disciples. Listen to this in Luke 9, 22 to 24. And we're almost there. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day and raised to life. There's your example. Came as a man walked amongst us, understood everything we go through. He worked hard, he felt the sweat of his brow, he was hungry, thirsty, go through the scriptures. 
And then he went through a mock trial and went to the cross. There's our example, church. And then what does he say to us? Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Which meant, take up your cross means put the death of your flesh. You're going to die to self. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose their life will save it. And then in Romans 12, 1, this is my scripture. I love it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, God's mercy is sending his son and saving us. Ready? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper act of worship. Living sacrifice. No matter what we go through, if it brings him glory and honor, we rejoice. We rejoice. Amen? We have to die to ourselves. We have to take all those desires that we have and say, they cannot come before the Father's will. Trust me, church. After 30 years of teaching, I wanted a book and go someplace rural and go off the grid. I wanted to have a horse, go out in the morning on a full morning like this. Try to detrot, try to detrot. No worries. Ah, God had a different plan. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But listen, do you not think there are times that I wrestle like, you know, See, that's my wife. She's there. I'm never going to get to go horseback riding in the woods on my own little farm. And then I got to step back and say, get out of the self-pity. You're doing the Lord's work and the Lord's will. Amen? Amen. But we go through it. So we can make plans, but we just got to trust God through what he has for us. All right? Amen? I got off on a tangent. All right. So I have down, and now as we move forward in verse 1, we got real far this morning. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's people who are in Christ Jesus and Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. So he's not saying, all right, look, overseers, deacons, you've got to be servants of God. He's saying all God's people, we are all to come under and be servants of the Most High God because every one of us has a gift and talents we can use as unto the Lord. Everyone have a boca, a mouth, la bouche in French? Then you can speak the gospel to somebody. He's put you one place, you one place, you one place, you another place to share the gospel. I keep bringing weight up. He goes on a job, he puts on 570, or he puts on his Christian music, and guys are coming up to him, what's that? And he's witnessing. And hardened construction guys are hearing the gospel. Then you've got softies, like my wife, going and, oh, I'll pray for you. And, but she's sharing the gospel with those she's working with. So no matter where God places us, we got a mouthpiece and we can speak the gospel. Or we could get involved in church, I'm putting the plug in, and get involved in the ministry here. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. In church, he refers to these as God's holy people. We've been sanctified. The term sanctified means to be set apart to God. That's what it means, set apart to God. Very simply, by being in Christ, we're separated from the world and we're set apart to God. The things of this world should not be our draw. Amen. Oh, I can't come to church Sunday. I'm going apple picking. Oh, we got sports today, so sorry. We can't get involved. You know what? All the Hall of Famers, unless they're Christians in heaven, it won't mean a hill of beans. All the money that billionaires acquired, if they're not Christians, it won't mean a hill of beans. The Lord's going to stand before the Lord. What have you? you done in my name. Did you accept me and did you use the gifts and talents I gave you to glorify me? Nothing else will matter. Amen. Nothing else will matter. I'm off on a tangent again. All right. And listen carefully. You're either in Christ or you're not. You're either sanctified or not. You're either in, set up in the world or set apart to God. There is no middle ground. There is no fence to straddle. Ellen and I were talking about this. There ain't no fence that you can sit on and say, one foot here, one foot here. You're either in that camp or that camp. And this will tell you how, what you're going to do in the here and now, and will also tell you what you're gonna, where you're going to be in eternity. If you're here and your faith is in Christ and you're doing the Lord's will, praise God, you're using what God's gifted you for. And you will spend eternity in heaven. If you're engrossed in the world, we see the wonderful things that the world gives us. Drugs, alcohol, perversion. It's such a nice place and you will spend eternity in hell. So you're either one or the other, church. So choose wisely. And if John Flores was here, he loves that. It's a line from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Choose wisely. All right, choose wisely. 
And as we study the scripture and look back at the Old Testament, the idea of sanctification is all through it. The temple was set apart. The tabernacle was set apart. The articles used in the temple were set apart, sanctified. The priests were sanctified. Their clothes were sanctified. The offerings were sanctified. And you know how they were sanctified? There had to be a shedding of blood, and then the blood was sprinkled on the priest, was sprinkled on the tabernacle, was sprinkled on the articles. And you know, we've been sanctified, but not by the blood of bulls and goats and rams, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been set apart to God. Amen? Amen. Set apart to God. And church, so it is with us. We've been set apart and made holy, being covered in the blood of the Lamb, the righteous Lamb. And now, church, that we've been saved, we are now in service for whatever purpose he calls us to. Amen? Whatever purpose. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. It's funny, Mike used this Wednesday night. For as by grace you have been saved through faith. Hang on to that. And this not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works that so man, no man can boast. Nobody can boast that we're good enough to get in heaven, that have done enough good works. It's only by the grace of God. We are God's handiwork. It means poem. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As my pastor used to say, when you come to faith in Christ, you put your name here and you sign here, and everything in between is blank and it's left open to the Lord. This is your contract. You've given your life to me. But go and do the good works I've called you to do with the gifts and talents I've blessed you with. That's our service, amen? In church, our relationship with the Lord and our service and dedication should not be a burden but a joy because it's bringing glory and honor to him. And I'll say it again, that should be our greatest joy, that his name is magnified, that the name of Jesus is lifted up. Amen? And we've got to get a good understanding of this by the few simple words we just read in Ephesians. And the words we'll read here in verse 2 of Philippians, which state, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. Family, look, all of us are born in Adam. All of us have a sin nature. All of us will sin, and we get more clever at it as we mature. We become more ma manipulative and more cunning as we mature so we can gratify the desires of the flesh. Oh, me? We get real good at it. And if anybody is perfect out there and doesn't feel that way, I'll pray with you here at the altar after service is over. When we sin, we act in rebellion against the Lord and violate his moral law. And the perfect, moral, and holy God must judge sin as sin. And the judgment for sin is death. Read Genesis 2, 16 to 17. And listen to these two verses from Romans 3.23 and 6.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all of us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We all deserve death but he's given us eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life, church. And that is what God's grace is. It's a free, unmerited gift given to us by the creator of all things, and we don't deserve it. That's mercy. He gives us this gift. It's called grace, that we can come into the presence of a holy God. Amen? We've been set free from the executioner's block. Do you get it? Set free. We are supposed to die the death Christ did and be thrown into the lake of fire, but he set us free because he took our place. He took the executioner block for us. Praise God. He came as the propitiation for sin and took what we deserve so we won't have to. And as Ephesians explained, when we believe into Christ and his redemptive work by faith, we receive the reward of that faith, eternal life. And I said it last week, you're eternally alive now in Christ already seated with him in heavenly places. Amen? Amen? And watch this. As we accept and receive God's grace, our whole relationship changes. We go from being an enemy to being a child of God. No longer under his wrath, but under his loving care. The whole relationship changes. Can you rejoice in that? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? The peace treaty between us and the Lord has been sealed in the blood of Christ, and it can never be repealed. Never repeal. You are a child of God and your name is written in the book of life. Praise God. Listen to Romans 5, 8 and 10. We're almost there. 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified <clears throat> by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So please don't let anybody tell you you're going through the wrath of the tribulation. We have been saved from God's wrath through him. For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then Colossians 1, 19 to 23. Ready? For God was pleased to have the fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Ready? By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, sanctified, set apart, without blemish, and free from accusation. He's in Christ. We stand before the Father justified, without blemish, forgiven. Not one sin that we have ever done will be put before us for condemnation. Woof. Family, we've been reconciled to God. We're at peace with him now. Sons and daughters, as of, Christ and, uh, as of God and co-heirs with Christ, in all his splendor that's going to be revealed. And not only do we have peace with God, but here's where we get into the rejoicing. We can have the peace of God if we're walking within his will and the circumstances are what they are. We can have the peace of God knowing that he's sovereignly in control over it. He's working it together for good to mold us into the image of his son or to lead somebody else to Christ so we can rejoice that his will is being done in us and through us. Amen? How do you think Paul, how do you think the early church endured? Think about it. They were persecuted, taken and impaled on stakes covered with wax and lit up on fire to light the streets of Rome, thrown to animals to be butchered and, and mauled. How do you think they survived? The grace of God and rejoiced knowing what was to come in Christ. Amen? That's how. And so can we, if we keep a heavenly focus, if we keep our hearts and minds on Christ, no matter what we go through, we rejoice because we know what we have to look forward to. Listen to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. So as we put our... Oh, sign that contract that, Lord, we're in your hands. He'll direct our paths. And listen to Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. And in Hebrews 13, 5, it tells us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He leads us along the path. Read Psalm 23, our good shepherd, until a day he takes us home and we enjoy the glories of heaven with him. Family, in closing, let me stress two points. First of all, have you placed your faith in the redemptive work of Christ and trusted him for your eternal salvation? Have you? If you said yes, then you're sanctified. You're set apart and considered a saint of God with all the promises of his word being yes and amen. Can you rejoice in that? Amen. And let me ask you, if this be true, can't you trust him with every area of your life now? If you have trusted him with your eternal salvation, heaven or hell, can you not trust him with every part of your life now? He died for you and I and loves us with a love we can't comprehend, and we can be joyful in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in because there's an eternal purpose. I don't know what it is. You may not know what it is, but God does. And with this understanding and through this morning's message that's based on God's word, not mine, being sanctified in Christ, we have been set apart to him so as to be used for his glory and honor. This includes using our gifts and talents, our time and resources to serve the Lord and not the prince of this world or our flesh any longer. And it also includes the uh, proclamation of his gospel. Don't you want to see other people come to faith? That's why he died. That's why he came. Aren't you glad that you came to faith? That somewhere along the line you heard the gospel and was saved? Amen? So I'm going to leave you with three questions to ponder. 
Have you accepted the free gift of God? Have you moved from judgment, wrath, and the lake of fire to eternal life in this kingdom? Basically, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Second, have you proposed to be a doulos of Christ, therefore fulfilling the most perfect call on your life? Do you know that? You could set your own paths, but it's not going to be the perfect call on your life. The perfect call comes when we submit our lives to Christ and do his will. That's the perfect call that we have. Because that's when we're going to experience what? The most joy. No matter what, you will find joy in the circumstances of your serving God. Amen. And this last question, very simply, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Are you in the Lord? Are you serving him? Are you willing to become a doulos, a bond servant for Christ, and submit your will to his, your life to his? Because in that, you will find the greatest joy. And the apostle who suffered a lot more than we have, said what? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord God, that you have called us out of darkness into your glorious light, that you've allowed us to understand this gospel of salvation and to be set free from the penalty of sin to be set free from death, to be set free from Satan's snare, and to be adopted as sons and daughters into your most glorious kingdom, heaven. We thank you this morning, Lord. And Father, as we submit our lives to you, Lord, no matter what life may bring, if we know we are fulfilling your will, through, and the test and trials come to what? Purify us, mold us, or use us in places to bring your gospel, let us rejoice. Amen. Rejoice because we know you're working in us and through us for a greater good to bring you glory and honor and praise. Lord, help us to have this doulos mindset. Help us to be like Paul, my God. Help us to bring the gospel of salvation and disciple others and do your will in and through the call and talents and gifts you've given us. Lord, we thank you this morning. May we be your bond servants. May we do your will. May we go out and share this wonderful gospel. And may we live for you because we will look forward to that day when we hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Hallelujah. And we will be with you forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for today. We just bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's just stand and worship the King.
Your shackles are no more For Jesus Christ Has broken every chain Sing I I will call upon the Lord For He alone Is strong enough to save Rise Your shackles are no more For Jesus Christ Broken every chain. We believe in you, God. Sing Jesus' name. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus. Sing it out. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call His name. Jesus' name above every all hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail. All hail the power of Jesus' name. I will call upon the Lord for He strong enough to say rise your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain and I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to say rise your shackles Shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Broken every chain, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We call upon your name. And our prayer to you is, oh, to be more like you. Oh, to be more like Jesus. Show us. Guide us. Continually teach us, Lord. So that we can be whole in you. We thank you for our service today. We thank you for your message, your word, and your spirit that's over us. As we leave here today, Father, we just want to we just want to thank you again and honor you with our praise and give you all the glory. We thank you for our church and we thank you for our life in you. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>